Welcome, uh, everyone, to today's webinar, How to Manage Weather Worries Faster, Safer, and Easier, sponsored by Earth Networks and put on by Athletic Business. I'm Andrew Berg, uh, Executive Editor of Athletic Business. Um, I think we've got a, a great and very informative webinar lined up for you. Um, today's presenters are Keith Leonard, Director of Operations at Maryland Soccerplex and Discovery. Every Sports Center, and Steve Prinzavalli, Program Manager and Meteorologist at Earth Networks. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to them right now, and we'll get this show on the road. Well, Andrew, thank you so much, and we're grateful for the support of the Athletic Business Magazine, not just yourself, but also uh, Michael Gallo, Sean Ray, your whole team, and collaborating with us here at Earth Networks. So I want to Thank you, number one, and also thank our friend uh, Keith Leonard, the Director of Operations at the Maryland Soccerplex and Discovery Sports Center for his time and efforts here today, as well as uh, Richard, Anna, Anuj, our whole marketing team here that's helped to put this together. We definitely feel this webinar will be very compelling, a lot of good information, so uh, let's dive right in. You know, the Absolutely. obvious thing here is, look, outdoor weather threats, they're a daily occurrence. We all know they're going to happen depending on where you are, there are gonna be different threats. Everything from lightning to severe storms, heat waves, uh, hurricanes, tornadoes, extreme cold, blizzards. Those are all weather hazards and they occur and they're always a concern and a problem. So just keep that in mind. There's no question you're gonna constantly have to worry about that. So the biggest severe weather threats in the United States, just looking at the last oh, century or so, we've had some uh, ones that have taken a lot of lives, unfortunately. The Galveston hurricane in 1900, a big heat wave in 1936. Many of the records, by the way, high, record highs, were set back in 1936 across parts of North America. So that was a tremendous year of heat. Hurricane Carla, you think of other hurricanes like Camille, the New England hurricane of 1938 that caused a tremendous amount of damage and resulted in many deaths. A big drought in 1988, I recall that, and the Midwest uh, resulted in $42 billion in damages. A big blizzard in 1978 resulting in over 100, or 100 deaths and for $500 million in damages. And of course, recently, you might remember Hurricane Katrina. I want to say recently, but that was actually about, yeah, 13 years ago now, but seems like it was just yesterday. And of course, Hurricane Harvey last year and we've had our share of hurricanes this year. When you think of Florence and Michael that devastated the Carolinas and the Florida Panhandle. But earlier in 2018, we also had winter storm Grayson and Riley, as well as southeast storms that produced multiple tornadoes. These are billion dollar weather disasters. So they are a huge problem. And we have uh, you know, numerous storms that spawn tornadoes throughout May and June uh, in parts of the Midwest and the Plains to ratios that cause deaths and billions of dollars in damages as well. So you get the picture here, friends. We are not immune to weather disasters. And unfortunately, with the Earth's climate changing, there's probably going to be you know, more of the billion dollar weather disasters that we're going to see. So if we just focus on a couple threats, lightning and heat waves or extreme heat, we look at lightning. And we at Earth Networks are blessed to have a lightning network that includes both sensors that can detect in cloud and cloud to ground lightning. So cloud to ground lightning obviously strikes the ground and it's what we're most concerned with, but there's also in cloud lightning that can be a precursor for severe storms. And that's one great thing that we have here at Earth Networks is a vast network of about 1500 lightning sensors all around the globe that can detect in cloud and cloud to ground lightning. So we looked at 2017 and we detected over 106 million total lightning strikes in the United States. And friends, each lightning strike, over a billion volts of electricity, five times hotter than the surface of the sun. So it means business and it, it unfortunately strikes a lot of people and can cause deaths and injuries as well as paralysis. Uh, so we definitely wanna talk about lightning safety and some of the things to look for. If you just look at these statistics, 106 million lightning strikes in the United States, that's about 291,000 strikes each day in the United States. So it is a um, unfortunate weather hazard that we're going to have to deal with. So you say to me, Steve, I manage a sports program and facility. Why should I care about the weather? 
Well, think about the impacts that this has on your campus or any outdoor location and the people that are impacted. You know, you get your stakeholders like your campus staff, coaches, faculty, students, and athletes, both on and off the field, spectators that are watching uh, the game, they came along, parents as well that are supportive, as well as others, including league officials and referees, safety officers, those in the community, uh, as well as police, fire, ambulance, rescue workers that might be in the area, surrounding residents, they're all going to be impacted by this. And it really spans the whole gamut, everything from tropical cyclones to gusty winds, snow and ice, lightning, extreme heat and extreme cold. But again, if we focus just on lightning and heat, you know, these are some of the big weather disasters as we've seen and probably what you're going to care the most about uh, when you think about a sports and recreational facility, an athletic facility, because lightning strikes and let me tell you, it strikes so fast, only about the size of a pen or a pencil, but yet it can do a tremendous amount of damage. As I said, over 1 billion volts of electricity, five times hotter than the surface of the sun, about 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Lightning deaths have decreased, so we forget the power and the fatality that can be associated with an unexpected lightning strike. Just looking quickly at different types of lightning. Obviously, what is lightning? It's a discharge of electricity caused when there's positively charged particles meeting negatively charged particles. Okay, that's science class back in seventh grade, right? Well, different types of lightning I mentioned. Cloud to ground, that's called CG lightning. That extends from the cloud to the ground. But there's also that other component I alluded to, the in-cloud lightning or IC lightning that does not make contact with the ground. You say, okay, Steve, why do I care about that? Well, the answer is I see lightning and a high incidence of such can lead to severe weather. Tornadoes, gusty winds, derechos, those are those straight line windstorms that can down trees, power lines, and cause devastation to homes, as well as large hail, flash flooding. All those are severe weather. And in cloud lightning usually precedes the cloud to ground strike. That is, if you have a total lightning network, as we offer at Earth Networks, you can get an early heads up when there may be that dangerous cloud to ground strike. And finally, I want to talk about the bolt from the blue. You see it listed there. It's a cloud to ground lightning flash that typically occurs on the front side or the back side of a storm. And it can jump out 10, 12 miles outside the parent storm from a seemingly blue sky. You may think it's sunny and nice and safe to go back outside, but then all of a sudden there's a lightning bolt that comes out from a nearby thunderstorm. You may not even see too much going on because again, the sky is blue and things look good, but then you've got problems with a bolt from the blue. So how does lightning actually develop? Well, once again, charges are separated within a thunderstorm cloud. Typically, you've got warm air rising and cold air sinking. As the warm air rises in the storm, it really tends to make that cloud grow vertically, very high, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 feet high. Eventually, you get that cloud lightning, that in-cloud, IC lightning or cloud-to-cloud -cloud lightning. And what happens is positively charged particles meet the negatively charged particles. That charge separation becomes so great, you have in-cloud lightning. But eventually, the storm, as it matures, as it gains strength, eventually you're going to see a dangerous cloud to ground strike that comes out and then after that the rain the gusty winds the severe weather possible tornadoes and large hail the severe weather usually comes toward the very end so that's why that IC or in cloud lightning component is so important to be able to detect and as I mentioned your lightning exposure is actually high highest just as a storm is approaching or as a storm is pushing away. The reason for that is many will have a false sense of security. They may go outside thinking it's okay. I can maybe hear a rumble of thunder, but it's not raining where I am, so it's safe. But no, it's not. Many people seek shelter only when it's raining and only when that storm is directly overhead. And there's a huge risk in doing such because you need to make sure you are inside and away from windows before a storm arrives and well after it until you get an all clear because again lightning can jump out 10 to 12 miles
from apparent thunderstorm cloud. And it's dangerous, needless to say. Two thirds of all lightning deaths in the United States are caused by being outside, outdoor recreational activities. 50 to 100 cloud to ground strikes occur in the world every second. Think about that during the course of this webinar. Obviously, there are going to be thousands of lightning strikes that occur globally, over 3 million strikes each day. 400 plus people are struck by lightning just in the United States alone each year. And as I mentioned, over 1 billion volts, five times hotter than the servers of the sun. So if you just look at an example here, we took a look at lightning that occurred around Atlanta, Georgia, large metropolitan area in 2017. Here's a detailed example of the impact. And you see that cloud to ground lightning in and across Atlanta, you know, was significant. If you look at the whole state of Georgia, 377,000 cloud to ground lightning strikes occurred in 2017. That's astounding. And there were over 2.7 million total lightning strikes. So that's cloud to ground and in cloud. So if you look at the proportion there, most of the lightning that we're detecting at Earth Networks is in cloud lightning. That's why that component is so important and it can help to keep you safe by give you, giving you that advance warning. Also notice that bar graph there in the bottom, that scale that indicates the total number of days above 80 degrees. Also want to make sure we mention heat because while lightning is a threat, heat can be kind of a silent killer and we'll talk more about that shortly. But a lot of days in Atlanta, known as hot Atlanta, right, where there are days where it climbs above 80 degrees. You can see in June, July and August, mostly every day is above 80 degrees. And you combine that with the humidity and it can be almost unbearable. So heat is also a weather hazard as well. And that leads us into the power of heat. And did you know that these are some of the effects of heat stress? An inability to concentrate, muscle cramps, a heat rash, severe thirst, that's obviously a big one, but that can come too late, almost after the fact. Fainting, heat exhaustion like fatigue and giddiness, nausea, a headache, moist skin, and even a heat stroke when it gets very serious. So did you know that the National Weather Service reported an average each year of 107 direct and indirect heat-related fatalities. So that's more than lightning, and that's far too many. A study by the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, found an average of 2,800 yearly hospitalizations related to the heat. And of course, NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, reported 94 direct heat-related fatalities in 2016. And finally, the EPA also said that uh, heat-related deaths are on the rise. So a lot of people being outside, you know, sports activities, athletic facilities, you know, those athletes are exposed and coaches, fans and spectators as well, being exposed to the heat, there can be some grave repercussions from doing that and not seeing the warning signs. Looking at the United States, we've had a lot of cities, not just Atlanta and not just your typical hot cities like Phoenix and San Antonio, but others that have climbed above 90 degrees in major locales. Think about this, in Memphis, Tennessee, you may not think of that as being particularly hot, 67 days of 90 plus degree heat. How about Albuquerque, New Mexico, 62, and Denver, Colorado, 34. So even the mile high city can have mile high heat, believe it or not. So how do you break it down here and manage these weather challenges such as heat and such as lightning? It's a simple three part Steve. process. I say simple, but it involves a lot of planning, meticulous planning, preparation, analysis, and implement, implementation. We break it down for you and call it the API plan. Analyze, plan, and implement. First, you analyze. You look at your assets and your exposures. What are your key weather threats where you are? It may be different in Florida versus in Washington State or Minnesota versus Texas. What are the activities and events? What kinds of threats are posed? What are the sanctions by uh, body guidelines? And how about evacuation protocols? You know, where are the safe shelters and locations? What do you do? How do people evacuate? Those are all things to consider kind of in your analysis and pre-planning. Then you go into the planning stage, friends. You develop pretty much with a spreadsheet by activity, you know, by sports and by time of year, you know, and by weather, um, what you do and what are the um, what, what's the plan of action? You know, what is the alerting procedure? What's the safety protocol? Um, 
you know, where are the designated shelters? Where do people go? Can they get there in a safe amount of time? What's the chain of command? Make sure you've got that outline. Who gets informed when? You know, when lightning is within a certain radius, who's going to get an email alert? Who's going to get that text message sent to their phone? You need to develop an effective communication strategy. So that's part of the planning stage. And then finally, you can have the best plan and best analysis you need to implement. You need to execute. Choose technologies that help to implement this policy. You develop alerts against established protocols. You educate all people, all parties, all stakeholders about the threats and the safety protocol, what to do when there's lightning at your facility during an event. You disseminate the policies and procedures, communicate the chain of command, whether it's athletic trainers, coaches, directors, police, fire, ambulance, rescue, referees, everyone needs to be informed, test it, evaluate, feel free to tweak it. No plan is going to be perfect right out of the gate. You're going to have to involve a little bit of uh, um, self-improvement over time, and that'll come. And you need the automated technology as well. Yeah. Yeah. Can we just pause there for a minute and let's let's uh, just now that you've laid that out so perfectly, let's let's ask the audience, you know, just kind of whether what their feel is for how they're doing in in implementing these kinds of strategies. Are they there, um, or do they need some help? Uh, just let me uh, let me throw the poll question up there, um, and if everybody can go ahead and answer, uh, that would be great. Steve, while they're doing that, um, how many weather incidents does a typical facility have each year, or what would a typical facility see? Yeah, well, you know, it's really going to depend, Andrew, on location. Um, you know, obviously, you know, certain locations are going to be more exposed. But you know, if you think about the example I mentioned there of, uh, say, Atlanta, Georgia, where I took the lightning and the heat. Um, you know, that could be a situation where you might have exposure to lightning during a, um, you know, during a summer season when the lightning is going to be most prevalent. It may happen, you know, 10 or 15 times. It really all depends. Um, you know, there are going to be locations like Florida that are going to be exposed to hurricanes and tropical cyclones in the fall, in the late summer. You know, they may have several during the year. Um, you know, they may not sound like a lot, but it's important to have that API, that plan in place, the implementation in place, so that when there are these disasters, when there are these events that are coming, you're well prepared, you can take action, you can protect life and property, and um, you, know, you are going to be able to have a robust plan in place at your facility that's going to really be valuable. Sure, great. Um, so uh, looks like uh, just a little over half. Uh, feel like, oh, <laughs> you know what? I actually threw up the wrong question there. We we actually asked them if they'd be interested in speaking to an expert for a free weather assessment. Over half, sixty percent said they would. So I'm guessing uh, that they they feel like they might need some help there. <laughs> uh, Steve, I'll let you take it back over. Sure. Thanks, Andrew. Very much. Great question there. And uh, yeah, you know, you talk about having technology. I, I mentioned. Um, you can have the best plan, but you need to have obviously the technology in place and to make sure it's working and make sure it's um, implemented correctly. Automation is key too, and I want to stress this. When you're running around and there's a weather emergency approaching, it could be a lightning storm, it could be, you know, you're, you're, you're going to see a, a derecho come through, a big windstorm. You can't spend time sending emails or trying to round up people. It has to be pretty automated. And by that, we offer real-time storm tracking, an outdoor alerting system that provides high decibel alerts when there's a lightning storm within a certain radius. And those alerts get delivered to your mobile phone. So it's really easy. It takes the guesswork out, and it also saves valuable time. But also other parts of the technology include a weather display. You know, the equipment is managed so that um, its up upkeep is very high, maintenance is well taken care of. Uh, there's localized forecast provided, a personal weather portal, and access to 24-7 meteorologists, which is so critical. And Keith may allude to this later, but like, it's so important to have the ability to pick up the phone and talk to a real meteorologist 24-7, because even if there's some ambiguity and you don't know, hey, is this storm that I just got alerted for, is this storm going to pass toward my north, to my south? It's going to hit our facility. What do we need to do? Do I need to you know, get people to seek action, seek shelter now. Um, to be able to speak to a meteorologist, get an expert opinion, could be really critical. It could be a lifesaver. Obviously, visualization of storms and 
The issuance of alerts is huge. At Earth Networks, we have dangerous thunderstorm alerts. Those are those polygons you see there in purple. And they indicate a high incidence of lightning that has prompted an automated alert. We issue alerts based on solely based on flash rate of a storm. If it hits a certain flash rate, we say this storm could produce severe weather, has a high incidence of lightning, and you know when there's a high incidence of, incidence of lightning, that could mean a lot of cloud-to-ground lightning, and that could be deadly, and you don't want to have that coming down, bearing down on your facility. So we measure both in cloud, the magenta, and the cloud-to-ground, the yellow bolts that you see depicted there. And again, those purple polygons are DTAs, or dangerous thunderstorm alerts. And one of the great things that we have is the ability to have outdoor alerts, audible alerts that you can hear and also that you can see. You think about those that are hearing impaired, fans and spectators, as well as athletes and coaches. Well, you've got the ability to see this, too, because there's not only going to be the um, horn that goes off when there's lightning within a dangerous radius, but also a strobe light will flash. So everyone's able to either see or hear it. They're going to seek shelter. And then most importantly, friends, there's a countdown clock that tells when it's safe to resume play, when it's safe for people at your facility, your park and rec to go back outside. After lightning has moved out of your area, usually you know, 30 minutes after the last rumble of thunder, um, that countdown clock will say, okay, it gives you a thumbs up, you're A-OK -okay to go back outside. That's a signal that you can resume activity. So great to have that countdown clock, very helpful. And then again, the alerts get sent mobily to your phone. They get sent in an automated fashion, so you're able to set the location. It might be you know, your school, your athletic facility, your park and rec, whatever it is. You set a radius, 10, 15 miles you want to monitor. Even if you want to get alerts as far as 20 or 30 miles out, it's a great heads up, especially with fast moving storms. We certainly advocate to do that. And then pick what weather variables you want to monitor. Could be extreme heat, could be wet bulb globe temperature. It might be um, lightning within a certain radius, or it might be the um, you know incidence of a, of a wind gust that's over 40 miles an hour at your facility that could down trees and power lines. Um, also, who's going to get the alert? Make sure you set up a distribution list. All that is so important. Having a network solution is critical as well. That's what we offer at Earth Networks. We have a network solution. And by that, I mean instead of it being a single node, and a single node lightning prediction system is much different than actually a detection network. A single node prediction system kind of works on if there's electrostatic charge in the atmosphere and enough of a strong electrostatic charge that the system feels there might be lightning. Well, that may sound okay, and it's probably a less expensive solution, but it's going to have a lot of false alarms, unfortunately. It's going to have a limited distance. It's also not going to have great accuracy, and it only typically is going to be able to detect cloud to ground and not that other component, the in-cloud lightning. There's some drawbacks with that single node, and that's why a network-based lightning detection system, which is real-time, lower false alarms, gives you the exact location if there's a storm coming. It leads to accurate lead times, and it provides a higher degree of accuracy and leverages a network. As I said, we have about 1,500 lightning sensors all around the world, which is huge in detecting lightning. So we talked about a lot of theory here. How does this look in the real world? We're going to break it down for you. We're going to dive into the weeds here and give you three scenarios. One, you're, at, you're an athletic director at a school. Two, a director of a park and recreational facility. And three, this is where our colleague and friend Keith Leonard's going to take over, the director of operations of a sports complex. How do you do to manage your threats? What do you do? And what are the key things to implement that API, that analyze, plan, and implementation. Uh -huh. Let's step through scenario number one. You are the athletic director of a school in Houston, Texas. Big metroplex, obviously, in Houston. You've got a huge school district. Maybe you've got multiple locations you need to monitor. Let's talk about your challenges. You've got organized sports and also IM or intramural sports. You've got rack outdoor programs, events, festivals, and outdoor hangout areas. So all those things you got to monitor, all those areas you need to be cognizant of. You've got an athletic department that will be impacted, emergency safety, campus security, your faculty, police and fire, referees and other groups. 
And there are a lot of challenges that are facing schools, like in Houston. Uneven policy, unevenly applied, can lead to issues. You've got multiple decision makers and responsible parties, multiple weather monitoring systems, kind of varying degrees of accuracy among them, and you've got decision makers that are trying to juggle a whole bunch of different priorities. So who really makes the call there? That's the question. Who makes the call? Well, Steve, let's break it down. Analyze. Really quick, sure. Really quickly Andy. before we continue. Yeah, uh, let's let's just check in with, with the audience and see if any of them are actually using a weather information service um, as part as part of their, their plan. Um, sure. Uh, one second here. Let me pull that one up. There we go, and have them answer that. Uh, while they're doing that, you know, when, when, a, when a facility is, is monitoring for, for say, lightning, uh, how far ahead should they be monitoring? When should they start asking folks to head in, indoors? It's a great question, Andrew. And, you know, I'd say as a general rule of thumb, you're talking about at least 10 to 15 miles out. Because think about it, a bolt from the blue, can strike 10 to 12 miles outside of the storms. I'd really recommend you can start monitoring 15, 20, even 30 miles out. I think by the time it gets to 10, that's too close. You're not cutting yourself enough time. Sure. You need to start monitoring at like 30 miles, maybe get an email that's sent to you know a few stakeholders, key stakeholders, and then, okay, within 20 miles, if the lightning is within 20 miles, then it goes to uh, the email alert or the automated alert might go to more people. Just because these storms can travel so fast, they can have a bolt from the blue, and you really need to make sure people are prepared. I always say with time, err on the side of caution, especially if you have a lot of fans, fans that may be um, you know, in need of, of, of special transportation to get to a facility, to get to a safe location, you really want to enable them to have plenty of time to seek action and seek shelter. So I'd say begin monitoring certainly well in advance of 10 miles out, 15, 20, even 30 miles out, you should have that set up to monitor lightning. All right, wonderful. Um, yeah, so it looks like a little over half are using some, some form of uh, weather information system. Um, let me see, the other uh, thing I wanted to just mention to the audience is that they can enter a question for you at any time during the presentation in the chat mode. Just click the little question mark next to it, and that will uh, turn it into a question. We'll see if we can get an answer. Uh, go ahead and take it away, Steve. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Great reminder, too. Yeah, that chat box is wide open, so feel free as we're rolling along and myself and Keith are presenting here. If there's anything that's not clear, feel free to chime in and feel free to ask that question. We'll try to get to them at the very end. Um, again, the API plan is simple. Analyze your factors. What are the stakeholders? Who are they? Students, athletes, coaches, staff, visitors there, referees, other people around, residents, the threats that are posed, right? Lightning and heat we've outlined. There are probably others, though, depending on your location. Look at your assets and your exposures, your sports field, your facilities, your campus, um, leisure areas as well. Uh, always consider the sanctioning body guidelines. What are you required? You know, you're, you're required to have a severe weather policy. Um, and a process. It's got to be in place. It's got to be active. Think about the sheltering locations, whether it's a clubhouse, a main campus building, and make sure it's secure too. Activities and events, you know, what kind of sports programs are going to be impacted? Football, soccer, lacrosse, track and field, uh, swimming and tennis. And there's protocols for evacuation when severe weather occurs. An alarm goes off, everyone needs to seek shelter. Where do they go? What do they do? And here's an example of the planning process a weather safety policy example of lightning here. You've got your detection method where uh, you know, the plan will mention the technology, whether it's an outdoor alerting system or some type of network-based solution, again, that will monitor lightning usually within about a 20-mile radius or so. Then you've got a safety protocol that indicates where people will go. An alerting procedure as well, okay, that horn might go off, the, uh, the strobe light will flash, and then people know it's time to get to shelter. Outdoor alerts may trigger at 10 or 15 miles. And then you've got those designated shelters. That's all outlined there in your plan, right? Where to go when alarms go off? Can people get there? What if there are those with special needs? Make sure they are able to get to that safe location as well. Uh, safety admins, chain of command too, needs to be informed. Who's gonna get those email and um, custom alerts? Who's gonna get those um, mobile alerts? And what's the chain of command? The athletic directors, the trainers, the coaches, the referees, and then a strategy of communication. 
obviously the public needs to be informed as well. You know, everyone needs to be aware over whether it's a PA system, horn system, social media, websites, school apps. Find a great way and a robust communication plan to get everyone to safety. It, again, will be well worth the investment. And then finally, the plan. The weather safety example here is with heat. Take the example of the wet bulb globe temperature. Now, what is that exactly? Wet bulb globe temperature is a little different than heat index because it accounts for things like the sun angle and also the clouds, if there are a lot of clouds in the sky, uh, as well as the wind. So it's more than just temperature and humidity. And it gives you an idea based on that wet bulb globe temperature, kind of a, a virtual temperature, what it really feels like when you're outside exposed to the elements, exposed to the sun, exposed to the wind, what it's going to feel like and what kind of work you can do and what kind of water intake you should have because your body's going to quickly get dehydrated. Take the example of if you're outside and the wet bulb globe temperature might be 90, okay? And, you know, maybe you're doing uh, some work outside, some, some light work. Well, you can do 20 minutes of that, but, you know, you need to also make sure that you're consuming water, three quarters of a quart per hour, and you're taking rest for 40 minutes. So this graph, this chart here outlines in beautiful form, a lot of detail, what to do based on your style of work, your type of work, type of athletics that you're involved with, and A, what kind of water, or you know how much water to have, and B, how much rest. So it's key that these athletes are given the rest. And let's not forget about the fans and spectators. They're exposed to the heat as well. We want everyone, certainly, to stay safe. And finally, the implementation component, API. Analyze, plan, and implement. Here's an example of a lightning detection and alerting solution in Houston, again, around the school. You take the example of one school, okay? At 20 miles, an email warning gets sent out to public safety directors and maybe the athletic director. They're monitoring the situation. That's great. Within 15 miles, text and email alerts go out then to your key stakeholders, your athletic directors, your athletic trainers, the safety team. Okay, you're monitoring the storm. You're preparing to stop the game, stop the event, stop action. And then within 10 miles, okay, horn is sounding, strobe is activating, time for everyone to get inside, away from windows, get to their safe shelter area. All activities need to be stopped, certainly when it's within 10 miles. What if you've got multiple locations, as schools in Houston do indeed have? This is a huge problem. You need to have maybe multiple horns, okay? A horn might have a radius where it can sound effectively within about, oh, 700 yards. So you wanna make sure around different school locations, and we've got three of them here around Houston, that people are able to hear or see when there is lightning within a dangerous radius. Maybe within 25 miles, that email warning gets sent out to the district athletic director. Then within 15 miles, email alerts and text messages are sent out to the key stakeholders. They're monitoring the storm and preparing to halt the game or the event. And then within 10 or eight miles, okay, the horn goes off, the strobe lights activated, outdoor event stop. Staff and students get to safety, get to shelter, and wait there until the all clear goes off. Remember, that's after that last bolt of lightning has occurred, you still wait 30 minutes after that last rumble of thunder or whenever you get the all clear to safely resume action. So that's scenario number one. Scenario number Steve. two says, okay, I'm a director of a park and rec facility in Orlando, Florida. Beautiful Orlando, popular place to go. You've got a very important job to keep people safe over a large facility, right? Parks and recreational facilities are massive. You've got recreational sports that are going on, outdoor programs, events, concerts, festivals. You've got people that are just hiking, biking, hanging out in the pool, on the beaches there, kids in the playground. Rides and attractions also might be taking place there. And you've got equipment and infrastructure. Saving lives, protecting property, critical. You've got different groups like the park safety team, the fire, the police, grounds crew. All those need to be accounted for all those need to be well informed of your communication strategy. So let's dive right into it. Let's look at the safety challenges that face the parks and recreational facilities. Large area, I alluded to that. You know, when we go to a park, it's huge. A lot of visitors there, high volume, need to make sure you've got a good plan in place. A large number of outdoor assets and greenery to maintain. Grounds crews might be cutting the grass, might be 
out in different parts of the park. They need to be well informed as well. And you've got a huge staff that's helping to manage this parks and rec. So analyze. What are the factors? Think about the stakeholders that are impacted. You've got your athletes, your visitors, your staff, your grounds crew, coaches that are there. Uh, just people that are there enjoying a concert venue, right? You've got those threats, lightning, heat, heavy rain. Where are the assets and the exposures, right? Your picnic areas, your trails, your pools, those are outdoor areas. And remember, two thirds of all those lightning strikes occur when people are outside and we want to avoid that. Sanctioning body guidelines, always consider those. Where are the safety regulations? State and local regulations are always key to analyze before you formulate your plan. Sheltering locations like the park office and also hard top cars in the parking lot. I stress hard top because you don't want to use a convertible, a motorcycle, or you know, might maybe a Jeep that has a, a canvas top. You want a hard topped automobile that can actually provide good shelter if there is a dangerous storm coming because actually the lightning can strike the car, go around the car harmlessly, and then into the ground. It's not the rubber tires that protect you, but actually that steel or metal frame, that casing of the car can act to protect you from lightning. Activities and events need to be considered. You've got picnics, social sports, swimming, outdoor lounging, running and exercise, biking trails, for instance. And you've got evacuation protocols. All those need to be analyzed. When the weather begins to turn really bad and severe, you monitor the situation, an alarm goes off, everyone seeks shelter. Here's an example of a lightning plan, okay? You got your detection method, talks about the technology. It might be a uh, detection-based system. You're monitoring within a 30-mile radius. It talks about the alerting procedure, technology, the safe shelters are laid out as well. Also, the safety admins and the chain of command for getting people to safety and shelter. Who's in charge? What are their responsibilities? And also, the directors who are overseeing the safety protocol. They all need to be well informed. You've got that protocol as well. It mentions what to do when there is lightning and it outlines the criteria for events, suspension, and resumption. What's the radius? What's the course of action? And then your communication strategy at the very bottom. It mentions how the policy is shared with the public. Everyone needs to be informed of this. What to do? The technology as well is very helpful, but people need to know when that light goes off, that strobe light's flashing or the horn sounds, it's time to get to shelter, stop action, and where do you go? Implementation. Lightning detection and alerting implementation is pretty easy here. You've got a th two radii, 30 miles and then within 10 miles. At 30 miles, an email warning is sent to your key administration, your director and your head ground groundskeeper. They're then well informed that, hey, there's a lightning storm coming. You need to monitor the situation. You need to seek shelter. And then within 10 miles, get ready because this storm is now moving in fast. Outdoor activities need to be stopped. The public needs to be instructed what to do and where to go. Where do you go? They need to know ahead of time. Here's an indoor area. Here's a safe shelter where you can go to your car in the parking lot. If you don't have a vehicle, here is a safe location to go to inside and away from windows until the all clear is given. So I've talked about two scenarios. Now I want to toss things over to Keith Leonard. He again is the director of operations at the Maryland Soccer Plex and Discovery Sports Center. And he is going to take us through scenario number three of the operations manager of a sports complex based on his experiences and perspectives, which is very valuable. Keith, take it away and tell us about scenario number three there. Thank you, Steve. Oh, thank you, Andy. Uh, you thank, you for, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this important subject that the Soccerplex is both passionate and uh, feels highly sensitive about, that is athletics and safety. Um, first of all, a little history about the Soccerplex. We opened in 2000. We are a 162-acre complex that is within the perimeter of a 650-acre recreational park. We have 24 full-size regulation soccer fields, 21 of which are natural grass and three which are synthetic turf. We, uh, we have a full-time professional maintenance staff and we 
primarily host soccer, but we also support lacrosse and any variety of other sports as well. Uh, we, we estimate that there are about 700,000 visitors to the recreational park each year. Uh, on any given weekend during the typical spring or fall soccer season, we will host on the order of 300 to 350 matches. So it is a busy, busy complex. We are also home to the Washington spirit of the National Women's Soccer League, a professional women's soccer franchise. Uh, some of the experiences we've had in the past and uh, uh, episodes that directed us to make the choices we have going forward, um, we identified lightning as a key threat very early on. But back in 2000, in the early 2000s, the standard protocol was to allow referees basically to make the decision regarding safety of participants and spectators. And uh, that proved problematic because many of the referees were young children themselves. They were high school age kids refereeing games under pressure from players, coaches, spectators to allow events to continue. And uh, we felt that was just not a war situation. Um, we also are subject to pretty severe rain events. And with 21 natural grass fields, we have to consider the resources that we have, the assets that we have and the potential damage that we might incur by playing through significant rain events. Uh, previously, uh, like I said, we allowed referees to, to basically render the decisions on closure. Uh, but in 2007, we actually invested in a single node lightning detection system. We did that for a couple of years and found significant problems with that solution and that we would get false alarms or that service for problematic scenarios was not expeditious and we ended up waiting several days to try to have a problem resolved when as we're all aware severe weather is an instant problem uh, so we basically in 2018 partnered with earth networks um, to invest in some of their technological tools and also the 24 7 services they provide we are both businesses in the Germantown, Maryland community, and we were both rising to national uh, relevance. So it only made sense that we would contact Earth Networks and try to utilize their tools to provide a much more robust solution. Uh, some of the, the an analyzation, the factors, the stakeholders affected, obviously we have many athletes on site, coaches, staff, uh, soccerplex staff, referees, visitors. Uh, the most prevalent threat for us is lightning in this geographic area. Um, it can arrive quickly and it can be devastating. So that was our greatest concern when we when we uh, approached the conversation with Earth Networks. Uh, the assets and exposures are outdoor fields. There is a system of hiker biker trails within the recreational park that is probably three or four miles long. We hold many athletic events as well as cultural events and community events. Um, as regards the Washington Spirit and some of the other events that we host, there are guidelines sanctioned by their governing bodies that require certain policies and procedures in place. So very early on, we've established policies and procedures for emergency management, uh, various threats, whether it be lightning or otherwise. Um, we've also got locations on site, albeit some small, to shelter people. When we are in the middle of summer and there's limited activity, few camps and whatnot, we have comfort stations that are restroom facilities that can provide shelter to people on fields that are proximate those buildings. We also have the Discovery Sports Center, which is a multi-sport indoor facility that can shelter several thousand people. But more often than not, when we are subjected to severe weather, the entire park being busy on 24 fields, potentially in the stadium, patrons are, are directed to their cars. Their automobile is the quickest means of shelter. Uh, evacuation protocols, we've also identified spaces for different threats not weather-related threats where people are directed to evacuate assembly areas.
So the strategy that we employed when setting up the parameters for the Earth Network's automated uh, technological communications were 15 miles because we wanted to give key staff members and key personnel advance notice of approaching lightning and or severe weather. So at a 15 mile radius, if there is a lightning strike, uh, I will receive text or email notification. The director of grounds will receive the same and five or six additional directors and or program managers as well as management staff on site. Then at 10 miles, that will trigger the automatic alerting system. So a horn will sound, which indicates to the general public and anybody within the park that lightning has occurred within 10 miles of the soccerplex, all activity is suspended, and all people should seek shelter immediately. There is also an automated horn that sounds when we have received an all clear. An all clear is a different horn sound, and it's indicating that we have not received lightning within 10 miles of the soccerplex for a contiguous 15 minutes, and the situation is clear and activity can resume. Steve, you want to cover the history of the lightning re report? Yeah, sure, yeah, I'll give that, a quick mention of that. Before we do that, let's throw up one more uh, poll question for everybody. Uh, just wanted to find out who feels like they're adequately uh, protecting their organization from severe weather. Um, and then before we pass it over to Steve, Keith, how, how, what's one of the weirdest weather incidents that you might have had to deal with at Maryland uh, Soccerplex? Uh, good question, Andy. I've been here since 2000, the entirety of our, our existence. Um, there was a span of three years. In 2010, we had what was called Snowmageddon in the Washington area, where we got three to four feet of snow overnight, basically. Didn't have a great impact on the activities because it was winter. Uh, 2011, we had a minor earthquake in the area, which was the first oh, wow. in my life in this area. That was during the summer where we had some camps going on. But the uh, most impactful was probably the derecho of 2012, where it hit on a Friday night as we were preparing for a lacrosse tournament. And it basically tattered an entire activate, activation and or sponsor area. And tents were shredded and steel poles were, were mangled. And fortunately, we were able to clean up overnight as the derecho left the area and resumed with the event the following day. Wow, uh, very interesting. Um, Steve, we'll go ahead and turn it back over to you. Sure, thanks, Andrew. And I can definitely remember all three of those weather impacts, as uh, Keith had mentioned, uh, you know, living outside the Washington, D.C. area. And, you know, he did a wonderful job outlining, you know, different scenarios, whether it was the, uh, the, the snowmageddon of 2010, the earthquake of 2011, of course, that ratio that uh, that came later in 2012, you know, certainly a, a, a full spectrum of weather threats. And that's just in the Washington, D.C. area. You know, you look at Texas, you look at different parts of the country, they're going to be exposed to everything from, well, wildfires that sadly we've seen in California and the extreme heat all the way to snowstorms and blizzards that we're now beginning to see around this time of the year. So plenty of weather threats, always good to have a plan in place seasonally for each one of these to make sure that you are staying safe, you're keeping your facility safe and keeping others safe as well, not to mention the property as well. So in 2017, just in and around Germantown, Maryland, here's the lightning report that we pulled here at Earth Networks from our lightning network, which again is a total lightning network. Over 11,000 cloud to ground strikes around Germantown and a total of, ready for this, 558,000 cloud to ground and I see lightning strikes in that area. So total lightning, very significant. And again, when you look at the whole picture there, the greatest proportion of lightning is of course that IC component. In cloud lightning can be a dangerous component because it gives you a, uh, a heads up. The storm might become severe, might trigger a tornado, flash flooding, gusty winds like that derecho, and big hail. So it's great to have that heads up and it usually precedes the cloud to ground lightning strike. So some of the takeaways, and I can probably toss this back to, uh, 
to Keith, given the fact that uh, you know he is the director of operations there at the Maryland Soccerplex and Discovery Sports Center. If you want to just uh, mention some of the takeaways here, I don't want to steal your thunder. Uh, no pun intended. Go ahead, Keith. <laughs> sure. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, public safety is absolutely a priority at the Soccerplex. Um, we take weather safety seriously. Um, we are passionate about sports and athletic, but we need to ensure that all our guests in the park are safe. So it's critical. Um, Real-time advanced weather detection alerting system is needed. Uh, like I said earlier, with respect to referees on individual fields, we wanted to take the pressure over human decision-making out of the equation. We wanted an automated system that would uniformly be applied to all activities on all our fields. And uh, lastly, just the wrong safety techniques and or misapplied techniques uh, can create uh, unsafe scenarios for all the visitors to the park. So we, we wanted to be certain and as confident in the solutions we were implementing as possible to ensure the safety of everybody visiting our facility. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, um, Keith. Uh, great perspective. And, you know, it's always good to hear from someone like Keith, who again uh, directs the operations there at the Maryland Soccer Plex and Discovery Sports Center, as to what his experiences have been, what have been his challenges, what have been uh, you know, his past experiences, what he's learned, and he's got a wonderful plan in place. And you can see how um, robust of a plan it is. He's executing and he's helping to save lives and property, and it's really wonderful. So here at Earth Networks, we have a team of. Uh, many meteorologists are constantly monitoring the situation around the Maryland Sports Complex, uh, as well as other uh, clients as well. You know, we were founded in 1993, so this is our 25-year anniversary, just outside of Washington in Germantown, Maryland. We've got a network, not just of lightning sensors I mentioned, but over 10,000 global weather stations that monitor things like the temperature, the winds, uh, the barometric pressure rainfall all those can be critical components and you can set automated alerts to detect such at your facility maybe you're most concerned with heavy rain and wet fields there absolutely turf management is critical and you need to make sure that you know you've got a field that is safe for the athletes there for those that are going to be participating and maybe it's a no-go because you just got three inches of rain over the last 24 hours, right? There can be a lot of hazards and concerns around rainfall. So we have a weather, a weather station network as well that monitors conditions. Also, you may have heard that we are the creators of the Weatherbug application. We sold that brand uh, about two years ago in 2016, but we're still their data provider. We provide them weather information as well. And our key solutions that we mentioned is outdoor alerting system, weather stations, but we also have you know, things like a camera network, a greenhouse gas network. We offer Spheric Maps. That's an application web base that provides real-time or near, near real-time weather information, lightning data, alerting information. We can set those alerts. All those are very valuable products that we offer here at Earth Network. So we work with a lot of schools, a lot of park and rec facilities, whether it's James Madison University, University of Maryland, great partners there, wonderful research facility. We also work with Howard University, NOAA, NIST, and NASA, our federal partners, Villanova, Arizona, Iowa State, Texas, Oregon. You know, I could just list a whole bunch of wonderful universities. Uh, Lee County, for instance, we work with uh, Cape Coral. We work with um, you know, a variety of other facilities as well that are helping their um, spectators, their fans, uh, their athletes to make sure that they're staying safe, to make sure they know where to go, um, and to keep everyone well informed of the dangers of lightning, heat, and other weather threats. So we've talked a lot here. I know uh, myself and, and Keith uh, have certainly shared a lot of information with you, and now it's our time to see if you have any questions I know, Andy, you've probably been managing this, but yeah. you know, how can we help answer those questions if there was anything that wasn't clear? So I'll just thank our team here at Earth Networks, including Richard and Anna and News, the whole marketing team, as well as Keith and our friends at Athletic Business Magazine, uh, Andrew, Michael, and Sean, for your assistance today as well. Without you guys, this wouldn't be possible. And our great listeners that have tuned into this webinar with some excellent questions. So, Andrew, I'll toss it back to you, my friend. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you, Steve. That was uh, very informative um, and a lot of experience and knowledge there. Um, we do have a few questions from, from the audience. Um, I'll start with, uh, with one. Uh, the, the, the audience member isn't sure if it's uh, an afterthought, or but um, all of the rain and storms they've had in the Pacific Northwest this, uh, I'm sorry, in the Northeast this year. Um, and they've had a lot of game cancellations and that kind of thing. Wondering if there's a field allocation protocol or rain protocol that anyone uses as far as rescheduling is concerned. Does Earth Networks do anything along those lines? You know, well, I mentioned we're monitoring constantly rainfall. Uh, heavy rain is a huge concern, and that can be caused by a high incidence of lightning that those dangerous thunderstorm alerts can uh, can alert you to. Uh, of So, like, we offer, and you have the ability to set alerts for almost any weather parameter, so you can monitor things like heavy rainfall as well. Um, but, you know, I'm, I, you know, I'm not really aware of anything. Maybe Keith might be able to chime in if there's something that, that he uses at his facility, but I can tell you that you know, when you think about rainfall and heavy rainfall and the effects that it can have, it's obviously going to be huge in terms of rescheduling and, and really the safety of athletes and uh, and those that are trying to get into a facility when you've had a prolific amount of rainfall, as we've had in the Northeast, over 60 inches in, say, Baltimore and Washington just this year. So, you know, we've been waterlogged, and I can understand that concern as well, for sure. But, sure. Keith, if you have anything to add, feel free. Uh, yeah, it's a very time-consuming effort to try to reschedule losses due to weather-related cancellations or closures. Um, we don't use any particular application. It's a lot of hands-on work. Um, we try to do as much preemptive activity to the fields in terms of their maintenance to reduce or minimize the number of cancellations due to moisture or rain accumulation and whatnot. But uh, it, it, it's challenging, certainly as seasons progress and you, your time gets shorter and the opportunity gets thinner. Um, but I'm not aware of a particular software that allows you to reschedule in mass. Uh, Keith, what, I'll do a follow on there. Another uh, person was asking, what's your recommendation in regard to mobile weather monitoring at facilities that your organization may utilize through a rental agreement? Um, practices that may utilize volunteers with, without staff oversight? Uh, whether we have staff, well, first of all, at the Soccerplex, we will always have staff on site when there is a rental or an activity on the complex. Mm -hmm. um, but those making critical decisions based on mobile information, uh, including myself, I, I think it's highly beneficial. And a lot of that information is available to the public through the through the uh, the weather monitoring solution we have on site. There is actually a weather station that the public can log into and get the actual conditions specific to the soccer plex. We will make nice. decisions from distant locations and communicate through our messaging solutions. All right, perfect. Um, Steve, this one looks like it's directed to you. Does the weather system provide incident reports for insurance companies? Uh, you know, we can certainly provide that. You know, we at Earth Networks can pool historical data. If there was an incident, and I, you know, I do that in my job. It's one of my many responsibilities is I will pool information, um, weather data, lightning data, say around the parks and rec, uh, around a, a soccer plex, around uh, an athletic field at a university to let them know, hey, you know, here's where there was lightning, here's when it occurred, here was potentially the dangerous cloud to ground strike. So yes, we can certainly do that as a, um, you know, as a, as, a, as a type of service to support our clients, to support our customers. That is absolutely something that we can provide at Earth Networks. We have all of our lightning data and weather data stored. Okay, great. And I think just one more question from the audience before we close things down here. Um, with all of the wildfires and that kind of thing, is there any capability in terms of smoke monitoring or air quality monitoring? monitoring? That's an excellent question. I'll just take a, a stab at that and say, well, you know, we at Earth Networks, we monitor, believe it or not, carbon emissions. Um, we have a greenhouse gas network. I alluded to it briefly there in that one slide about five minutes ago. And what we monitor are things like carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, uh, water vapor, H2O, as well as uh, methane. 
And, you know, those are, you know, more or less your, your invisible gases, so to speak. So in terms of smoke monitoring, well, we're not really in that realm, but we're always, I'll say this, um, uh, we're, we're, we're always interested in new technologies that we can either develop or, you know, use a partner to leverage with that can help to create a more robust and comprehensive safety solution. And given what we've seen with the wildfires in the West, you know, smoke is a huge concern and fires are a huge concern that, you know, the sky's the limit and that's certainly a possibility. But we, we do monitor certainly the weather, the lightning conditions, as well as those greenhouse gas uh, conditions as well. But in terms of, uh, you know, actual smoke monitoring, we don't have a, a device or a sensor in place to specifically monitor the smoke. Uh, but visibility is something that obviously is tracked by many of the uh, weather stations that the government has, for instance. So uh, there's a way to do that, but we don't have any alert per se that's related to, to smoke. All right. Uh, well, I guess that's about all, all the time we have right now. Um, I want to thank Earth Networks for sponsoring a great webinar. Keith from Maryland Sportsplex, uh, thanks so much for joining us and lending us your knowledge. And, uh, and I also want to thank the audience for tuning in. Uh,